Good morning everyone and welcome to this uh, QLOC webinar this morning. My name is Miranda Newell, I'm a librarian with the University of Queensland and I will be taking today's session on EndNote for thesis writing. Before we get started, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, could you please uh, switch off uh, any video and also please mute your microphones. If you do wish to ask any questions or um, identify any technical issues or communicate with us in general, please use the chat feature in Zoom. There will be two people, two of my colleagues with me today, Scott and Kay, who will be able to assist you via the chat or pass your questions on to me. Um, they will be identified on the chat under Chat Monitor Scott and Chat Monitor Kay. And please also um, be aware there will be time at the end of today's sessions to ask any questions. So the EndNote for Thesis Writing is a class that we developed at UQ uh, as part of a, in t a small in-team project and we developed, we had five people as part of the project and uh, with our communal ideas we developed this course. And the idea from the course came because we had a lot of questions from our higher research degree students doing honours, masters, thesis or PhD thesis and uh, we put all of those questions together that we received from our students and developed this class We've been running the class for about two years now and it has proved to be very popular. So I hope today we'll give you some ideas around doing this kind of class or perhaps just expand your knowledge with EndNote. We will be uh, using EndNote X8 today and we will be teaching it in the Windows environment uh, where there is uh, differences with a Mac environment as part of a class we do try and point that out so I will try and do that also today. So what today's session will be covering is backing up your library, how you can tidy up your library so when it creates your in-text references and reference lists it comes out cleanly we will look at the basics of editing citation style, how you can use the journal's term list for dealing with abbreviated and full journal names, how you can and how you can combine different EndNote libraries. Then we will move into the working with Word side of things. So we will look at the best way of merging multiple chapters, which is often the way uh, students write their thesis how you can create chapter reference lists, working with track changes, and we'll finish up by looking at some of the recovery options that are available to you if your library does corrupt. Okay, so we'll get started. So I'm just going to switch into the uh, EndNote screen. Okay, so I am just uh, got a pre-prepared library that uh, when we teach this session, what we do do is send out a practice library to all of the students and that way they're not working in an existing library because we do, you know, play with it, I guess, and so we won't be breaking anything of their own. So for classes um, at UQ, they students sign in to, uh, sorry, they register for the classes. So we do have their email addresses and the day before the presenter, the person who's training for that day will send around uh, a compressed library and some examples uh, in Word for them to use as well. So for today's session, I'll also talk a little around how we teach that as we feel that might be something of interest to you as well. Okay. So we start off by looking at how you can set some preferences in EndNote that we find be, are useful when writing a thesis. So to access, if you're not familiar, if you go into uh, edit and then down to preferences, in a Mac, the preferences are housed under uh, the EndNote X8 option, which is in the top left-hand corner. So these preferences are changing for all of your libraries. So any change you make here will be reflected in any library that you use with your EndNote on this particular system. So the first one we look at is the display fields. 
with this is with if you're not familiar the information that displays in this middle panel so uh, the one we do suggest adding to this is the record number now if you're not familiar with a record number this is a number a unique number that is allocated to each reference that is added to your library but each library will start at the number one and then move through it for each move up for each uh, reference that you add to that library and that record number is used to associate in a word document so you it's not good practice to have multiple or different endnote libraries and references from different endnote libraries all being added to the same word document because you could have say a record number two and you've got in three different libraries there are three different references and then when endnote looks at that record number it could say well which one are you wanting me to use here so we strongly recommend only having one endnote library talking to one word document and also it can be useful to be able to identify which uh, record number goes with which reference so having that um, easily viewable is something we suggest to, that is added so I we suggest adding changing this first column I personally don't find the red unread very useful but you can put it somewhere else or change in a different column if you wish so I'm going to change column one so all of the different ones so of course you can structure this any which way that you like you can put a record number at a different point somewhere in the document so I like to put it at the front but it's up to the, the personal person using it and then we just click apply and you should be able to see in the left hand column here now those record numbers are appearing so that's the first one we suggest the next one is under the libraries option so if we now click on where it says libraries and this is uh, how the library then opens when you first open EndNote. So probably by default, you'll be aware that um, EndNote opens the most recently used library. So when you open your library, if you have multiple different ones, you can be seeing um, and adding references from a search and you don't have EndNote open, it can send those references to the wrong library. So while it's not necessary, this is a, another one we suggest and you could either have it prompt to select so it brings up your file explorer. Alternatively, you could choose the do nothing. I like to go do nothing and then we can apply that one too. So the last one we suggest that people um, make use of is in the PDF hand, sorry, the PDF handling option. There's a couple of different things that you can do in here. One of them is every time you attach a PDF, you can have it change the name to one of these options. The other one is this auto import folder where you can specify a specific folder on your um, computer so you might have a folder called PDFs and then when you check the enable automatic importing option you can then it'll then say okay which folder would you like to do this for and you can set it the thing to remember here is that every time EndNote then opens once you've set this up, it will ask, it will attempt to import any new PDFs that you've added to that library. Now, if you're familiar with the import PDF option, you will be aware that not all PDFs will import cleanly. So it's a bit of a choice around if you would like to do that. The other thing to be aware of with this is that when the uh, PDF imports if you have it set so it will sorry it'll add that PDF to the last open library so that's another reason to have the PDF libraries option uh, change so it doesn't add the PDF to the wrong library 
So those are the three preferences that we suggest to students that they might find useful. It's up to them if they want to add them or not. And, but they do find those uh, options useful when uh, using EndNote in relation to a thesis. Okay, so I'll just click on OK and we've added those preferences. So we'll move on to the next section where we look at uh, cleaning up the library. So when uh, adding references via the direct export option, we will all be probably very aware that accessing multiple databases, it's very easy to have duplicate references. But when it comes to writing, it's best to have a clean library and not have those duplicates. It can cause issues with some referencing styles. Um, if you're familiar with the APA referencing style, which I use a lot in my work, uh, having a duplicate reference can sometimes cause issues where they have used one um, record and then they import a, the second duplicate and then EndNote thinks they're actually two different references and it will do things like include the, the initials in the in-text reference, which is correct APA referencing uh, when you have the same, have the same surname, but EndNote doesn't always recognise uh, different uh, the same author as the same author. So it can, can cause confusion around that. And it's good just to have a clean library anyway. So we uh, talk about the find duplicates option. And if they're continuing, if students are continually adding references to their library, it's something they should be doing on an ongoing basis, not just do a once off. And then they add a whole new select uh, of references and they seldom remember what they already have. So the chances of getting duplicates again are quite high. So if you're not familiar, um, the find duplicates option is under references. So references, find duplicates. And what EndNote will then do is say, okay, we found these and we think these are duplicates. And then it will highlight, as we can see on the screen here, where it has found differences. Now, sometimes those differences aren't something that is a problem for you. So either one would be fine, but in other cases, it might have a PDF attached, it might have more information, or one might have more information than the other that is useful to you. So then you can select by clicking on keep this record and the other one gets added into the trash group over on the left here. Sometimes you will have more than uh, just two copies of the same reference. So EndNote usually cycles or goes through each one and you can choose which of those records you would like to select. If you're not sure, you want to have a closer look or whatever reason, you can click on the skip button in the top right here and it will jump onto the next uh, duplicate reference. So you can go through them one by one and have the uh, ability to select yourself. However, if you're happy to let EndNote do it to, um, and do a bulk one, when you come into the screen, you can then click on cancel. And we can see now that EndNote is showing a duplicate references group over on the left here. And in the middle pane, we can see that every second one, because there's only a second copy of all of these, is highlighted. If I had, for example, say three or four versions of Wilson here at the end, then the first one would be unhighlighted and the next three would be. So EndNote selects the most, the lower record number as the one it's going to keep. If for some reason you look at that and go, well, I'd like to change that, you can use the control key or command key in uh, Mac and switch it around. So you still have that ability to select at this point. Uh, a common one that I find uh, is that EndNote will sometimes select the one that has the PDF already attached. So that's, that would be a time when I would want to change it. So you can then uh, drag and drop that information into the trash 
Alternatively, you can right click and choose the move references to trash and then you'll just be left with those um, ones that are unhighlighted. Um, I'm not going to do that today because uh, of something I'm doing later on, but that's how you can get rid of duplicates from your library. I'm just going back into the all references list. Other things that we talk about when it comes to tidying up your library is making students, and this is something we find that students just seem to think of this as an automatic system, a bit of a set and forget type thing. So whatever the database sends, it, the student will accept that. And as we're well aware, just because the information is in the database doesn't mean it's A, correct, or B, uh, comes across and shows up in EndNote fully. For example, sometimes um, there might be additional information in a field, the uh, case of a title isn't correct. So students, we stress that students need to review what there has been added into their library. One thing, for example, if we have a look at record 24 here, I'm just going to highlight, we can see that the title is in all uppercase. Now, say for example, if you're using the APA style, they use sentence case for a lot of their titles. So if I am using APA and I know that, I would need to edit this so it doesn't show up in my reference list incorrectly. So to edit a reference, you can do it over here in this reference um, section on the right, but this tool is actually in when you double click and bring up the full reference screen. So in um, Windows, this is how it works. And when you come in here, if you can see these uh, font tools up the top right here, if, you, if you're on a Mac, uh, what you need to do is there's a, I'm looking at this option, the change case option, and that's available in the edits. So you first need to highlight what we wish to change. And then we can see our change case option, which is on the furthest right here, changes and becomes active. And so you can change. So if you needed to do something else, there's a few different options there, but we can see that sentence case is there. And it's just a bit of a time saver more than anything else. The one issue around using that is, if you're familiar, is it will change everything. So there still may need to be editing done if there is a term in there that does need capital letters. For example, a country, state, Australia, Queensland, something like that. But that is one little shortcut that you can do. Other things that we remind students about at this stage is if they've done manual entry or they need to double check, is make sure each author is on its own line. Uh, also, if they're using a, what EndNote refers to as a corporate author, so that would be a government department, an organisation name, something like that, to make sure that they've added the comma to the end of it to stop it treating it like a personal name. And the other... Um, so once that's all done, we can go and save that into our uh, library. Another thing you can do to clean up your library is sometimes when you download off a database, it's something that has just been published or it's in press or it's online ahead of publication. So you might want to check if the volume and issue has been added. So you might like to check or you want to check um, if there's been updates to any of your references. You can use the um, update reference option that is available. So to do this, what you can do is highlight the references you would like to check. Now this option is available through the right click in Windows. And what we want is this find reference updates. We can also access it through the references menu bar at the top of the page, uh, find reference updates. <clears throat> so you'll need an internet connection for this because what it does is it goes out and scans on information like the DIY and checks things uh, out in the wonderful world of the web, things like Crossref and things like that. And if it has found either a difference or there's further information, it brings up uh, this little window which looks a little similar to our find duplicates and it has the same 
system where it highlights where the difference is. So over on the left, you can see it's got available updates and your reference, the current information you have is appearing here on the right. <clears throat> so you can then scroll through and go, is anything updated? This, for example, in the pages, <clears throat> uh, it has the full year range, which is required for most styles. So you can then edit the reference or you can update the empty fields or you can update everything that's been highlighted. If you don't want to do any of that, you can just skip or we can cancel out. But that option is there rather than you having to go and track down that information. This is something that is worth checking first. Okay, so once you have uh, tidied up your library, the next thing we're going to have a look at is how you can edit up, oh sorry, edit output styles or reference styles. So in this class, we teach very much the basics of editing a style. We don't actually go into much um, about how to create a scarf from scratch or anything. Most, the reasoning for this was that most students' questions that we received are basic tweaks to an existing style. They'll come to us and say, this style is not doing this or I want it to do this, how can I do that? <clears throat> so we show them um, how that is possible. So if you've never done this, you can access um, this by going into edit and coming down to output styles. So if the style is already selected and you wish to edit that, you can choose one of the options here. The other way to get to it is open the style manager to find if it's not listed here. And so say for example, uh, you wish to edit Vancouver. So you just highlight the reference and then you can come down to this edit option down the bottom right here and it will bring up the style template. <clears throat> so this is all the, so we explain what the style template is. So it's all the rules governing how the style works in Word. So we give a bit of an orientation of what they're looking at. So over on the left hand side here, are the different sections that are able to be adjusted or edited. And then in the middle is just the explanation about the style itself. So these top ones are kind of like global ones. Then you have sections for the citations, the in-text references, the bibliography, the reference list, the footnotes and the figures and tables. In the class, we focus on the bibliography, the citations and these ones up the top. Um, not so much these ones, but they are available, of course, to adjust. The very first thing that we stress when doing this is to always make a copy as your first step. You should never edit an existing style because if you either get uh, too many mistakes or it's not working and the trouble is you can tie yourself in a great big knot with this, you can always just get rid of that one you've just created go back to the original, create a new copy and start again. Once it's saved over, it's saved over and there's no going back. So this is a big thing we stress. So the first thing to do is file, save as, and then you can give it a name that is relevant to you. And so you might be changing page numbers or sections or something like that, and then click on save. So I'm just gonna cancel out of that. Unfortunately, the way our computers are set up some of the security we can't save at this point but we can show so I don't know if you have that concern as well but we can still show this and we do get a lot of students who are on their own devices so they're more than welcome to um, save at that point if they wish so as part of the class what we do is highlight um, just some of the ones and the some of the most common questions that we receive. But the big thing for students to be confident about is to have a go, to try it out. And a lot of this experimentation is what we would be doing if they came and asked us about it. So for example, 
um, you might be interested in changing how the page numbers appear. So what you could do is click on the page numbers option up the top here. So this is how the editing works most of the time is you click on an option and EndNote gives you some choices and then you select the one you want, save your style and then you would go into Word, choose that style and see if it's doing what you want. A lot of it is try it out, does it work? No, okay, come back and try again. If you're familiar with any sort of programming, it's the same idea. So um, at this point, say for example, in Vancouver, they usually just put, they don't put the full page range, but if I was doing APA, I would need to show the full page. So you can select that as required. Another common one we see is around uh, author lists. So uh, for whatever reason, the way it's showing, they wish to change. So EndNote can show you can change how it shows up for the first appearance. And so uh, list everything. And then for every subsequent appearance, show the first one or the first three and then follow it with et al. You could italicize. So just whatever option that you would like. Another one, another APA one I get an awful lot. You may do as you deal with APA a lot. How do I get rid of the initials? which they shouldn't be doing, of course, but the option is in this author name in the citations. Under here, it says use initials only for primary authors with the same name. So that's an option that you can add in there, for example. So again, it's just making the choice. And of course, knowing where it's actually in that list. So you just have to have a look. Okay, that goes most closely with what I want. In the bibliography or the reference list, this templates area in particular is sensitive. We always warn students to be very careful about what they remove from here. Most of these punctuation marks often have some kind of meaning other than being a full stop. So the vertical bars, for example, um, make the style do a certain, um, thing. For example, um, it may be that if there's no information in this field and you put a little character in, it won't show up the field name or something like that. But what we, would, all we talk about in our class is if, for example, in the journal article here, you wanted your volume number to be bolded. So very simple stuff. So you could highlight the field name and then we've got those font options again up the top here. And so you could bold, you could italicize, you could underline. So um, they can make that kind of change here as well. Another one we quite commonly get asked in the bibliography is the layout. And in particular, how do you do a hanging indent? It's not obvious at first look. So if we come right down to the bottom right hand corner here, this is where we can find the hanging indent option. So you can apply it to everything or just the first one or everything but the first one. Another option you can do here is that here it says end each reference with. So a common question is I want to be able to put a space between each of my references. So you can do that by just hitting the enter key on your keyboard and if you're at all familiar with the um, puncture, oh, I can't think what the markings anyway, that show up for punk, um, certain uh, things in Word, that little symbol appears, which is the return symbol. And all you then have to do is save. And then at the end of each reference, that line will appear. So those are the main ones that we discuss in our um, session. And just remember that it is a lot of trial and error and don't be afraid to play so long as you make that copy. If you've made that copy, you can mess it up and it won't have any diet, well not diet, but bad consequences for you. Okay, so I'm just going to close out of this. I don't want to make any changes. So I'm just gonna say no. And I've still got my output styles um, list. So I'm just gonna close out of that and return to my library. Okay, so for the next one, 
the next section is uh, looking at the journals term list. If you haven't come across this, the journals term list is how EndNote handles uh, abbreviated journal names and full journal names for different, differing styles. The journals term list is something you need to add to a library. It's not already um, existing as part of it. So, if you come into the tools and then to open term lists and we select the middle one here, the journals term list. If for some reason when you go to this option and these are all greyed out, just make sure that your library is active by clicking on it and then that should bring them up. So as soon as you start developing a library, EndNote does start building a terms list for you. However, if we have a look at this library, we can see a bit of an issue already. So I'm just going to bring out the screen a little bit. So in a journal's term list, what there is, I'll just make this a little bit bigger, are these four columns for a full journal, an abbreviation one, abbreviation two, abbreviation three. So if we have a look at what is here now, in the full journal column, we've got an abbreviation, but in abbreviation one, we have a full journal name. So that's incorrect to begin with. And the problem here is with a style, what you can tell it is which of these columns to read. So no matter what information is in the journal name, if you tell it and you've got a journal term list installed, if you tell it to read from the full journal column, it will go, okay, that's that journal name. It matches this full journal name. Okay, then it will use that full name in the list. So, but if I'm telling it to read the full journal name here, it's still going to get the abbreviation. So the first thing you should do is get rid of any uh, names that are already there and this will not affect your references in the slightest. So sometimes you might only have a couple. If you've got a larger library, there might be more. And just highlight and then we just click on the delete term option over on the uh, right side here and we have a clean slate. Now to import a term list, these are in your program, the EndNote program when you install it. It's just not added to your library. So it should have the correct library name up the top here and we have the journals term list highlighted and down over on the right here we can see we've got the import list option. So in Windows it should go straight to that area and we can see the uh, file path up the top here. So sometimes we find on a Mac the file path doesn't come up but we do provide that in a class but if you're working on a Mac today and you can't see it, look in your applications, EndNote and then there should be, a, uh, I think it's called terms in a Mac but it's a folder or and they're called terms and you'll see this list. Okay, despite the dates here, these are the up-to-date ones that EndNote has available and you can see they're generally uh, discipline based. Uh, unfortunately, there's not one specific for every discipline available. So students just need, or people just need to select the most closely aligned one. Uh, I deal a lot in uh, Kay and Scott as well in the medical area. So that's the one my go-to. But another thing to be aware of, and if you have a look at the file sizes down the side here, is that some are quite extensive and others are quite small and that's fine. It's just the nature of the discipline. So as you can see here, the medical one is quite big and that's about 14,000 odd references, whereas law is about 900. So you just highlight the one you want. You can add more than one, but you can only have, you can only import one at a time. So if I now just go open and it's now doing its thing and it said, okay, I've now added, as I said, about 14,000 here and we click on okay. So if they did want to add another one, they could do so. But if we now go back to our terms tab 
and we have a look at our list here, we can see quite an extensive list. And there's our full names, abbreviation one and abbreviation two. The main difference seems to be with abbreviation one, they have full stops, whereas abbreviation two don't. That's useful to be aware of because while this list is usually relatively extensive, there are still going to be times when it doesn't have everything. So sometimes what we suggest at this point is go back to your Word document, click on your update, citations and bibliography and have a look through the reference list. And if there is still, and you need, for example, the full journal name and you still see some that have the abbreviation, it's because it's not listed here. So in this case, it needs to be added yourself. And that's fine, you can do that, but they will know, you will need to go and research what that is. So um, they could come and ask us, a library staff, of course, or use um, Google or web or journal web pages. Okay, but to add that, you just click on new term and then add full, and abbreviations as required and click on save. And then they can go back to their Word document, update once again, and they should be able to um, have that change into the correct style. You can, if you want to, if the style is not doing what you would like it to do, it is also of course possible to edit the style and change it to this particular um, area that it's reading from your journal's term list. So again, say I wanted to ed edit this in annotated, I get back into my output style template and then it's a global one. So if we come up the top here to journal names, we can see the option here. So annotated uses the full, but if I wanted it to be something different, I've got those as well. There is an option to don't replace, but then you really have a, a hodgepodge, so it's probably not advisable to use that one. But that's also possible. Okay, so I'm just going to close my uh, style template, and that's how you can use your journal's term list to um, deal with uh, abbreviations for journal names, particularly when we're doing a lot of direct export and you can't choose when a database sends that information for you. Okay, so the next section that we cover in, the, we will be covering is how you can combine different libraries. So sometimes, um, oftentimes with students, if they're coming into the PhD program, they may have done a master's or an honours, so they've already got a wealth of research, but they would like to start a new library for their PhD research. So what they can do, so they can keep that original honours or masters if they wish, is um, add that existing library into a new one, or you can also of course combine into an, uh, an existing library as well. And we do that by importing an EndNote library. So I'm going to create a new blank library. Okay. I'll just call it my EndNote library webinar. So if you have an existing library, this will work the same way. The big thing to keep in mind is the record numbers will change. So this library should be used <coughs> with new Word documents. Okay, so you've got the library <coughs> to which you wish to add um, another library and to do this we go into file, import and then file and this brings up our little import options. By default EndNote, um, this will open to the EndNote library option which is the one we want and then we need to go out and choose. So. I'm going to import this library I've been using today, which is this library class example. <clears throat> so the thing just to keep in mind is use the ENL file. Um, don't use a compressed and don't use the data folder. And then at this point, if you wanted to, you can 
choose to have EndNote select what are duplicates and what aren't and if um, discard them all or import into a separate duplicates library. Um, I like to import them all and then you can leave that last one and we just go import. Now if you did have PDFs attached to this they would also come across and now we've just got those in our new library. So very easy to do. The other way is um, not all the time do you wish to add an entire library. You might just want to add a few. So that's very easy to do as well. Now in Windows, if you want, you could, um, sorry, pile them either vertically or whichever way you want and then just drag and drop them across. The other way is you can select from your library using the control key or the command key in Mac and then you could either right click or go up to references and then come to this copy references to option and then oops you have the option here to either add it to a new library, select one you've already created, or if it's already open, you can select to send it to there. So you can then just add those to your other library. So that's really easily easy to do, but it's um, useful for students to be aware of that that's an option for, for them to do that. And um, they can then have everything set up in the way that they wish. Okay, so that's um, focusing in on the EndNote software itself. What we're going to move on to now is if uh, using EndNote in association with Word when it comes to um, writing your thesis. So I prepared earlier a couple of um, chapters. So I've got a chapter one and I've got a chapter two. So the way we recommend or what is recommended um, to create uh, one document from multiple libraries, oh, sorry, from multiple Word documents, is to first create, have them open, and then first create a new blank library. We don't recommend having, you know, chapter one and then adding everything else into it, simply because that keeps them, them as separate files and also as a backup. So if something does go wrong, you've still got those originals. So at this point, I'm going to create a new library. Sorry, a new blank Word document. And then <clears throat> for each of our um, chapters that we have, we need to first turn these into unformatted citations. So we come up to our EndNote X8 tool and to Doing this is a safer way of moving bulk text around and then when you're ready to merge them all together and update the entire document, uh, it's a much cleaner way of doing it. So first make sure that you have um, the right document open and then we come into Convert Citations and Bibliography and we come up to convert to unformatted citations. Now, for those on a Mac, this, work, this uh, toolbar looks quite different, uh, only in that most of the options are in drop-down menus rather than laid out separately like it is here. So the convert citations and bibliography options are in the tools. And so if we click on that, it changes everything. So if we have a look, if you're not familiar, into all for unformatted, so we've got our first author, our year, and there's our record number in the curvy brackets. So sometimes students, when they see that, they go, oh, is that what that is? You know, sometimes it inadvertently happens and it causes panic because the reference list also disappears. But now you can see um, just that unformatted. So we do that with both documents. Okay, so once they're all in that layout, we can then just copy all of the text and add that into our Word document in the, you know, in the order as required.
Okay, just add that one here at the end. Okay, so we've all got it sitting in one document. You know, you can have them sitting on separate pages and stuff like that if required. But once you're happy, you can then come back and click on your update citations and bibliography in your EndNote toolbar. Oh, sorry. I don't, oh, I know why I did that. Okay. So I'm just going to, sorry about that, the joys of technology. For some reason it's not mapping across. No. Okay. Anyway, when it when it does work, the um, because it's, the, it's the correct library, I'm just going to go into my edit and manage. Okay, that's how it should work. <laughs> Okay, anyway, that's when you normally do that, that's how that should work. Okay, so um, once you have done that, it should then update and have the document working as it should. So I do apologize, I'm not quite sure what's happened there. It was all working okay as it should earlier. And okay, shouldn't do because it's saying APA in. Oh, I've got a damage. Ah, okay, my library is not happy. <laughs> Sorry about this, folks. I'm just going to close out of my EndNote library and I'm just going to run it off a different area. Okay. Okay, I do apologise, technical issues. Okay. Here we go. There we go. Okay, sorry about that folks. <laughs> and now as we can see, so these, what I've done now is um, the library's talking to me again. So what we're looking at here is our um, library all updated with our references and one reference list at the end. Okay, so when it does work, that's how it should work. Okay. So once um, you have done that, you can then continue working and save this uh, this uh, full file. Perhaps call it final or something like that. Okay. 
So another thing we um, suggest to our students is uh, sometimes it's useful when you get to this final stage, you've brought your thesis all together and it's now a very large document. So what you can then do is um, if you're using an author date style such as APA, you can, uh, every time you insert a reference, it takes a long time for it to update the entire document. So as a bit of a labor, uh, time saving step, what you can try is working in the unformatted citation way. So every time you then insert a reference, it doesn't need to update the entire document. It just puts it in straight away in that unformatted method. And then when you finish working for the day, you can click on your update citations in bibliography and uh, work in that way. So you could switch to um, unformatted. Hopefully it won't be okay this time. And then if you have a look in your EndNote X8 toolbar, you can see also this instant formatting gets switched off. And what the instant formatting, as the name suggests, means when as soon as you put something in, it can um, show up in this format rather than when the instant formatting is on, it shows up in the correct formatted way. So if you want to, you can just switch that off here as well by clicking and turning on or off the instant formatting as needed. So by working in that unformatted way, <clears throat> it can be a little bit more um, time effective and you're not waiting for your document to update vast amounts every time. And then the big thing to remember though, is when you save and finish for the day to always update and turn the formatting back on, it's not a good idea to um, save in the unformatted way because there are, in the formatted style, there are tools that can help you if um, there are issues. So we always strongly recommend, last thing you do, update the entire document and then save and then you're finished for the day. Another um, area that I'm going to cover today is if you want to add a reference list to the end of each chapter rather than a combined one at the end of your document, EndNote can help with that as well. The issue around or the problem with using this method is that it uses, makes use of words section break tools and and commonly in theses, um, people use the section breaks because they've got um, images or tables or diagrams or something, and they use the section break to have a different type of formatting in that area um, outside of the rest of their document. And the trouble with this is if you're using section breaks for other reasons, EndNote doesn't know the difference. And so what it will do is every time you have a section break, it will add references for that above section. So uh, in particular with UQ, we have a particular format for the theses and sections are quite commonly used. So we do stress this so students are aware going in. There is a way around it and I'll talk about that in a moment, but it is interesting to be aware of this for if you're writing for publications or for something else. So to do this, um, it is a, thing you need to edit in the style. So if we come back to EndNote itself and we come up and go back into our output styles and edit. So I've got APA selected. So first thing you would do of course is file, save as. And then to do this, you come into the sections, uh, which is one of these sort of global things up the top here. And then you've got a couple of different options. So you can create a bibliography for each section. And if it's a numbered style, you can continue the numbering. Or you can create one that has a bibliography for each section, as well as a bibliography at the end. So there are some options for you. And once you have done that, you can select that style in Word. Now, obviously I haven't created it here, but EndNote actually comes with an APA sections already. So that's what we use to demonstrate this. So to do this, 
if we pop in where we would like our section break to go. So uh, if we come into our layout options, in uh, the word tools we're using here and into breaks and into the section break section area here. It's the similar on a Mac. You can select to have it on a next page or you can choose to have it continuous. So I'm gonna go with um, continuous here. And then all you have to do is just pop in those section breaks at each point that you want those um, section breaks or those reference lists to appear. Once you have done that, you can come back into your EndNote tools and select the relevant style. So here, um, the one I want isn't listed. So if I come into our select another style, I'm just gonna jump to APA and we can see APA sixth sections here. And if I go okay, and now that should automatically update. And if we have a look here, I'll just scroll slowly. So there's our chapter one. And there's my references that relate to that. And there's my chapter two. And the references that relate to that. So this one does just reference lists at the end of each section, not with an additional one at the end. But of course, you can edit the style to do that if you wish. Oh, sorry, I've just had a question from someone. Um, can I clarify why it is best it, to save with formatting switched on? Um, it's actually when it's one of the options when you can't as a recovery tool with the traveling library. Um, what that is, if you're not familiar with um, the traveling library, is when EndNote in Word has the formatting switched on and it's showing as we can see here, there's actually um, all of the reference information is contained within this formatting. And that's what EndNote refers to as a, as a traveling library. And if you have issues with your library and it's gone completely and you can't recover it, but you do have Word documents with those references in, you can export this traveling library from your Word document and recreate those references. And so that is where we, if you have saved your Word documents in the unformatted way, that traveling library doesn't exist. So that option is, uh, isn't available to you. So it's not necessary, necessary, but one of those troubleshooting options is no longer available to you. Um, I hope that clarifies, and I will be showing you how that works later on. Um, if that doesn't help, please let me know. Okay, so that's how you can then create um, your reference lists at the end of each chapter. And as I said, unfortunately, that only works if you're not using section breaks for other reasons. However, we do have a second option that um, students, we can make them aware of, and that is a little bit more laborious, unfortunately. What it involves is keeping the chapters um, as separate as we've got them here, and then, um, what they would do is get their chapters to the exact point that, you know, it's like finalized, completely finalized, and they're happy with it. And then what they can do is for each chapter is to convert them into a plain text version. Now, if you haven't come across this previously, um, this is where you can create a second copy and you can do that by going into your convert citations and bibliography and convert it to plain text. And what it does, um, if you haven't already saved it, it will ask you to um, save a backup copy. So it's always a good idea to make sure it's saved because um, as I found when I uh, saved this, it's, um, sorry, I'm just gonna create a new folder here. I accidentally clicked on, I think it was continue, and it created the plain text, but didn't save my EndNote version. So I lost one version. So it's always a really good idea to make sure that you've got your um, file saved before you do this step, because it's too easy to click on the wrong button. 
All right, so if we come into our Convert Citations Bibliography, for those of you on a Mac, I think it's under your Tools drop down. Convert to plain text and it will give you an explanation of what it's about to do. So this command will create a new copy of your Word document and remove all special EndNote markers, so that EndNote connectivity. The new document will appear in a new unsaved document window. The original file will remain opened and untouched. So it's creating that second copy. Do I want to continue? Yes, please. And if I now have a look, this is the copy that we're looking at. And if you're familiar with EndNote, when you connect, click, sorry, on the um, references, they usually go grey when that connectivity to EndNote is still there and we can see that's no longer there. And if I have a look, see we've got this document too. And so it's at the moment unsaved. So they could then save this document for each and do these steps for each chapter and then create a new blank one and copy and paste each chapter with their relevant re, um, references at the end into the format they want. So in that way, they've got chapter references for that chapter at the end of the chapter with how to use the section breaks. It's just a little bit um, more time consuming, but that option is available to them. So if you, and it's quite often we get students saying, you know, oh, I use section breaks, what else can I do here? It's something um, else that we can give them. Okay, so that's how you can um, add reference lists at the end of each chapter. Another thing that we stress as part of this class is track changes. Now, I don't know if you out there have had the joy of students coming up with EndNote in Word doing really strange things. Um, I've had an instance of where the student was using a numbered style, but and occasionally the reference would show up um, with all the author names listed and it was actually a track changes thing. So we make them very aware that track changes can interfere with EndNote in Word. Um, it seems to be in particular when like a comment is applied directly to the reference or a change is suggested on a paragraph and the whole paragraph has been highlighted and so a track change has been applied on top of it. And what it seems to do is cause conflict. So EndNote and track changes don't play well sometimes. And unfortunately it can be one of those things where sometimes it's fine and sometimes it isn't. But a lot of what this class is about is best practice um, and making students aware of the dangers to hopefully circumvent some of the issues that we see with them. So we make them aware that EndNote and track changes don't play well with others. So what they can do to deal with that, it's not very, it's not a really nice piece of advice that we can give them. We suggest they can discuss this with their supervisor and say, look, when you put a, a, a track change actually on the, um, it seems to do if it's around it, it's okay, but when it's applied to an actual EndNote created data, that seems to be where an issue is. So maybe they don't use track changes. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the time they're very keen on something. So another suggestion is that the students send a plain text version to their supervisor. The issue with that is of course then to still be able to use the EndNote version of the document, they have to manually make those changes. And some students are happy to do that. Um, sometimes I've had people suggest perhaps they could use the unformatted method and send that document uh, so long as the supervisor was aware of that. But sometimes the issue can still remain if they've applied the track change to the uh, unformatted citation. When you go to update your document, it can interfere at that point as well. So uh, it's a little bit of, discussion with their supervisor and it's really an awareness thing for them and then how they've decided to proceed around that is really they need to work what works best for them. The other thing though is if they do run into problems is to make them aware to look at their references and have a look at the track changes. Are there comments applied to that yes, get rid of the comment and that will generally fix it. Uh, is there a correction applied to it? Okay, yes, have you accepted it? No, accept the change and then that seems to help as well. So there are a couple of things that we've discovered in our um, 
uh, run-ins with track changes and Word documents. And another thing just to be really aware of is it's a really good question to ask because it's not always obvious. And um, I know one of my colleagues, it's one of the go-to questions. And when you get strange things happening, okay, have you been using track changes? So hopefully um, that might be useful to you or it might be useful to make your students aware of if you don't already. Okay. So one of the last things we'll look at is the disaster recovery. And as we could see, my library corrupted on me earlier. Um, so what I'm going to show you is some of the uh, things that we uh, make uh, our students aware of. You may already be aware of these. Um, there is, there's a really nice EndNote page on the endnote.com website that also talks about um, some of these. So, if we go back to our library and disaster, we've gone to open it and it's given us that corruption message that I demonstrated for you earlier. Um, it won't open or they get that horrible message that I've seen upon occasion where it just says end note error and no further information, but nothing seems to work. First step. So there's three things I'm going to show you today. The first one is something you may already be aware of, and that's the Recover Library tool that's available within EndNote itself. So the first thing to do is to make sure that your library is closed. Um, sometimes you can have the library open, as we saw earlier, and then the error message pops up and it won't let you do anything. So come up into, so have EndNote at the gray screen like we have here. And if we go to Tools, and then to Recover Library, Okay, and it will give you a bit of an explanation of what's about to happen. And we go okay, and then we go out and we attempt to select um, the library. Oh, I know what's happened there. Um, that has you've been giving you a problem. So uh, I'm just going to choose the one I've been using today. It's it's okay at the moment, but um, we can still run this, and you just go open. And what it will then do, and which is a little disconcerting the first time you see this, is it then brings up the save screen again. But if you notice the file name now has the word saved at the end. So this will be the recovered version. Okay, and then we just go save and we let EndNote attempt to recover it. Now just be aware this doesn't always work, but it's like the first thing to try. Okay, and in this case, it has been successful. It has said, I've recovered 30 references. Um, sometimes you may not get them all back if there's been a corruption, but it is there. And if I go, okay, and I can then go and um, open that library. So at this point, what I would suggest is uh, you change the name or get rid of the corrupted version and change the name to your original one. So it then becomes your working library. So if I open that now, it's all um, fine and I'm able to work on it and I still have that connectivity to any Word documents that's related to that. So the recover library is the first option and the easiest one. Okay, that hasn't worked. Okay, what can I try now? The next thing you can try and uh, the first time I saw this, I thought it was pretty cool, is you can use this if the recover library doesn't work. You can also use this if you have inadvertently lost the .enl or the library file, but you still have the data folder. And I find students, they'd go on a merry cleanup and they accidentally get rid of the wrong file, but they forget to check the data folders as well. Um, another thing is if they do do this, recommend that they double check their trash or their recycle bin because they may have done it to that point but actually haven't emptied it. But if they have emptied it, um, then this is the next best step to try. So what we're going to do is I've got a data folder here called social media 2018.data but I don't have any associated ENL file. So what I am now going to do is we're going to um, trick, trick EndNote into thinking we've got an EndNote library. And to do that, we use the notepad. So for those of you on Windows, it's usually under the Windows accessory. So it's just a little plain text editor. On um, Mac, you can use the text edit. 
So we just open that program and all we do here is we go file, save as, making sure that we save this in the same place as that data folder. Now, if you're doing this because your Fiery has corrupted and you've still got the ENL file, move the data folder to a separate area so it's not sitting in the same folder anymore and then give it the exact same file name. So social media 2018, but instead of it saving as a TXT file, what we do is we change this to a .enl. Okay, so we don't worry about the text documents at the bottom here. Just save it exact same name, but end it .enl. And then click save. And that's all we need to do. We can now close Notepad down. But if I have a look here in my area where my social media is, we now have a social media 2018 endnote. And if I now double click on this, we have now rebuilt the library, okay, from the data folder. So um, if you've lost your ENL file, you can recreate it. And it's also worth trying if the recover library doesn't work. Unfortunately, this sometimes doesn't work as well because the corruption is in the data folder um, rather than in the ENL but it's a really nice thing to try and it looks pretty cool to be able to pull it out of, um, out of the ashes as it were. Okay, so that's option two in recovering a library. Option three is the, we always, always call this the Hail Mary and the one I was referring to earlier with the traveling library. So we have lost every trace of our EndNote library. However, we have one or more Word documents that have used references from that library and it's in the formatted style. So if I come to this final document I created earlier, so open it, that document in Word and in the EndNote X8 tools, you can see we've got this export to EndNote option and there's an option in here, export traveling library. So if we click on that, it will then give us this option. But this option will not work if you have the unformatted way. So what you can do is you can add these references to an existing library or you can create a new one, which is what I'm going to do here. But what you can do if you've got multiple Word documents that you've used in relation to the library that's become corrupted, the first time you do it, create a new one, but for each document after it, you can just add those references to that same library and hopefully not have too much duplication across all of those Word documents. Okay, when you're ready, we just click on OK. And then we save it. I'm just going to call mine traveling. And it seems to sit there and not do anything for a little while, but just give it a few minutes, depending on how big your Word document is. And when it's ready, it should come up with a little message like this one, export complete. And if I click on OK, and if I now go back into EndNote, if we have a look here, see how it's got traveling up the top? There's my library, okay? And I can add references. The trouble with this is your record numbers will change, the PDFs will not come across, but hopefully you've got the PDFs still stored in a folder as well. But the reference itself has come back. So in a Hail Mary situation, at least it's an option for students to have. Okay, so that's option number three when it comes to um, creating, uh, recovering a library. However, if the person has done a backup, which is a very important part of any sort of research, then a lot of these recover libraries will not be uh, an issue. So this is a thing we really, really stress with students is the importance of backing up not just their EndNote library, but any of their research. So what we recommend is that they always have at least three copies. 
and that those copies are in three different locations. So it's not much use having it on your laptop and a USB because a USB can get lost very easily. And if something happens to your laptop, which is also quite easy, um, unfortunately, uh, then your backups are gone and they're quite easy things to happen or lose or um, get damaged. Whereas if they make use of space such as university servers, um, students uh, might have space as students of course, but if they're um, studying through a school uh, as a PhD, they probably have space on the university servers as well. Another option might be to have a quarantined internet email account that's not linked to anything else. So make sure it's not linked to your Facebook or Twitter or online shopping or something like that. And you could email a copy there. Uh, when making backups and using the file names should have no spaces, be descriptive, but not too long and include dates. And we always recommend in identifying the backup as such in the file name. So the example we've included there is backup underscore PhD thesis and the date. Because the backup should be exactly that. It should not be your working library. You'll have your library that you use every day and you continually using. The backup is a copy you create that you then save to wherever you want it to go. And we rec recommend backing up regularly and weekly is what we suggest. Uh, we find as students get closer to their submission date, it's daily, but um, they need to get into a backup routine. So something like, for example, every Friday you make your three copies, you put it in your three locations, and then you can go off and enjoy your weekend. What we stress to them is think about how much time and effort it took to develop that library and think about the stress of rebuilding that library. And um, how that routine works is up to them, but it's something they need to do and get into the habit of doing. It's not worth doing it for six months and then, you know, 12 months before confirmation and you're not doing it at all. And that's when you'll have the problem. It's the law out there that if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong, you know, two days before your confirmation or two days before submission or something horrifying like that. So when you say it like that, students usually go, yeah, that sounds about right. And often I've had, we've had students in classes going, that's happened to me, which is the best um, reiteration of that, that we can give them. Okay. That's backing up your library and a lot of the questions we get is about cloud storage and can I use it? If you've read the EndNote uh, LibGuide um, recently, they do talk about cloud storage there and they say don't, no, no, no. Um, for us, what we suggest is, and we, when we say cloud storage, particularly some students don't necessarily associate what that means. So we give the example of Dropbox or OneDrive or Google Drive or something like that. And then sometimes that makes it clearer for them. What we suggest is do not work on your EndNote library from the cloud storage drive. And when we say work, what we mean is go to that cloud storage drive and run the EndNote file from there. And if you've ever seen this, um, an EndNote library can corrupt. Um, I had a colleague who had someone on a cloud storage and it would replicate every time they went back to it. The, the, um, the library kept duplicating and it was because of their cloud storage. So it can give you some really funky um, and strange happenings. But I think it can be used as storage because what you would do is you would create your backup, you would stick it on there and it's only there in case of emergency. And if something did go wrong, you would then take that from your cloud, save it to your local device, computer, and then open it. So unfortunately, I don't think we're going to stop them because cloud storage is so convenient. But I think if we can stress that it's always, don't ever run it from there, save it onto your local device and, and do it there, that might help save some pain perhaps. But when creating a backup, the method that we suggest is using the compressed library option. So I'm just going to go back into EndNote um, in case you're not familiar with it. And this is where, because 
um, EndNote creates the two files when you create a library, the ENL and the .data, which um, we were referring to when it came to the troubleshooting. So some students aren't always aware that there's the two files, which is why they delete one and think it's all gone sometimes. But to create the backup using the compressed library, it's just under file, compressed library. Those of you on a Mac, Mac gives you an option when saving to save as a package because it recognises there's two files. But I would actually recommend using the compressed library option instead because if they want to use that file on a Windows computer for whatever reason, um, I don't know that Windows would recognise that. So the compressed library is in both systems. So I think it's just safer to go this way. And then they can um, go with the defaults if they wish, click on next. And this, at this point, you could save that with the word backup. Backup traveling and today's date, 25th 09, 2018. And then once they've created that compressed library, they can put it out into their various locations. And compressed library works best if you're going to use email as well because the data when you add a data file to our email it tries to um, unpack the uh, data folder so it's best to use a compressed library for emailing regardless if it's for backup or for um, or for just emailing okay well that brings me to the end of the um, formal class today um, I'd like to now give you an opportunity to ask any questions over the chat service, if you wish. Um, and I will just read out a couple and um, give a response if you like. Sorry, I'm just reading. Yep. So if you do have any questions, please let us know um, on the chat. And as I said, um, we do run this class, if even, it, sorry, not even, you um, please, if you have any questions around teaching the class or EndNote itself, we're happy to, um, I'm happy to um, talk to that if um, you wish. Also, I'm just going to go, so we're doing the questions, but I'm also just going to pop up um, our contacts. So um, our email addresses, so um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact myself or the others if you wish. Okay, I've had a quick, that's a very good question. The question was, and you probably can see it on the chat, each time you do a backup, do you need to keep previous versions or do you need, only need to keep the most recent backup? Uh, good question. I think that's a personal thing. Um, my suggestion is uh, keep maybe two or three previous versions, but not too many more than that, because then you're A, taking up space, but B, it's quite easy to get very confused. So, um, so I have some people who are very um, concerned and like to keep lots of copies. And I'm of the mind, I like to keep at least you know, not the most recent one, maybe two or three previous to that. But I think it's something that's a bit of a personal choice, but not to keep, you know, six months worth or, or something like that. So I, when I talk about this with students, I do sort of say, look, it's a bit of a personal choice, but this is what we suggest. Just make sure you have very clear um, idea um, naming so you know which ones are the most recent I think would be the most and have a have a like a convention about how you name them. Um, I hope that answers that. If not, um, please let us know. Uh, EndNote, I've just had a question. Do we cover EndNote online with students at all? Um, yes and no. <laughs> we, um, we get quite a few questions around syncing more than in relation to EndNote online. Um, students seem to find EndNote online 
and we don't actually teach it per se. We seem to we focus more on the desktop version. When we do talk about EndNote Online, it's in relation to syncing um, and collaboration is another big area we get asked about that. Um, you know, so many of them are doing, you know, they want to be either to be able to share their library with their supervisor or they're doing a project of some sort. So EndNote Online is more talked about in terms of the syncing and the fact you need to have an account and how EndNote Online works with the syncing. Um, so that's, and we sort of talk about um, the fact that if you do share a library, um, EndNote X8 improved that quite a bit. EndNote X9 has um, improved on that a, li a little bit more. So um, we do talk about how they can use EndNote Online to share their library with others and also how they can use it um, to access a library via the desktop on another computer. So what they can do is have a library on their work computer, sync it to the EndNote Online, and then on their home computer, they can create a new blank library and then sync it. And then they can access both desktop versions, but keep them up to date via the sync. I hope that helps. Um, Oh yes, what advice um, do you provide to the owners of shared libraries? Very good question. Uh, I, we talk about, um, we've started doing it more so um, in terms of the desktop way it's sharing with um, in the last couple of versions. So we, um, in EndNote X8, when you shared um, your desktop version, Things we, we would talk about is in EndNote X8, once you shared a library, everyone had access to it. So making them aware that when you share your library, everyone has A, access and B, can do anything to it. So, um, you know, remove PDFs, edit, start, um, edit references and things like that. So sometimes they're not always aware of that. Of course, with EndNote X9 or 19, there you now have the ability to put read, write and read only access on it. So we'll talk more around that. Um, we also talk about um, if you're going to share a library, don't share your at your library, either create a copy of it or only share maybe a section of it. Don't share the whole thing. Um, we also talk about the importance of being aware of copyright around PDFs. Um, if you're sharing with people external to your institution, those PDFs were accessed through your institutional access and shouldn't those PDFs shouldn't then be shared beyond the university. So if somebody has access, um, you know, if they're, UQ, for example, from a UQ perspective, if they're all UQ people, that's fine. We all have the same access. But for someone out in industry, for example, those PDFs shouldn't be shared. So awareness around the copyright. So those are the kinds of things we discuss around that. Um, if any of these questions I don't answer fully or you would like some clarification, please just put it into the chat. Um, another question we had was, do you recommend EndNote Online to students as another form of backup or is it your preference, the desktop version and backing up via a compressed library? Yeah, absolutely. They can use EndNote Online as um, a form of backup, but I suggest having EndNote Online as well as, so it could be say one of your three locations as an example. And um, it can be incredibly handy to have the online backup because it can be quite easy to recreate the library um, and you're not having the worry of the compressed library you know you have to have it rename it save it and add a new copy each time so yeah absolutely um, it is a, we do um, recommend it or you they can use it it's it's another option for them um, if okay and another question if your library has become corrupted and you pull down a backup to use instead, would there be any issues with the Word document that contained the reference in the prior library? Do you rename the backup with the same name as the prior one and then update citations or would that, would, um, and then update citations? Would that be enough? Um, honestly, because it's a, a pretty close copy, you could really, um, just open the Word document and hit update citations with that backup version and it would 
um, there shouldn't be too many issues. However, my re the way we would recommend it, and certainly the way I would do it, is to um, rename the backup with the name you've been using um, the, from the original corrupted library, because then, you know, every time a backup uh, sorry, every time you had to use a backup, the name changes again and again and again, because it's highly possible that that might happen. So I'd suggest first rename the corrupt library or get rid of it. And then with the backup, rename it to the original um, name that you've been using and then do the update citations at that point. I think that's just a little bit safer, but it, if you, you know, did it the other way, I don't think it would cause huge problems. Okay, another question. If a researcher wanted to combine Word documents that had been created with a different library, would you, oh yeah, would you have any recommendations? Putting the journal articles into a thesis by publication? Maybe, yeah. That's a really good question because we often get that one when we talk about in the class about the fact of having only one library um, associated with one Word document. Um, we often get people who have chapters that have each have, when they have multiple chapters, they have multiple libraries that relate to each chapter. And that thesis by publication, that's becoming a big thing for us as well. And the same situation. If they have already done it, um, what we suggest is um, creating a single library. So adding all the references into a single library and then with each of those um, chapters or publications, you should be able to turn them into unformatted and then put it all together. And, and then when you update it, depending, sometimes EndNote is surprisingly resilient. It will find things in that one library. Otherwise, what will happen is it will come up and you may have seen this um, and we could see that earlier where I was having those issues where it comes up and says, um, I can't find this reference, but perhaps and they will suggest. So what they may have to do is I often talk about it as reassociating. So what they might have to do is choose the um, reference and like essentially reinsert it. The trouble is it depends on how many have done that. So that could be a reasonably time consuming thing or it could be of quite a short thing. So that would be my suggestion is to put it all into one library, put all of those documents into one document in unformatted. And when you click on update, you may have to, you know, reinsert them, but you don't have to go out and find it, EndNote will often suggest, and then you can just check that one, choose that one and insert it. So I hope that makes sense. Please let me know if I can um, clarify that any further. Uh, I've got another question. Do you recommend syncing to back up and recover? I find this really easy as you always have your library backed up online and very easy to recover, including PDF. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's an option. Um, I had a student really recently and she had no end of trouble with her desktop, but she had a up to date online version with all her PDFs and we were able to just um, create a new blank library and sync it that way to recreate a desktop version. So yes, yeah, that's perfectly good. And um, if you're keeping it up to date via the syncing, um, then if something does go wrong, you can create, recreate that desktop quite easily. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at a couple of other questions here. Um, please, if there's anything else or if I can clarify anything any further, do please let me know. Okay. If, oh yes, so if I think this person is asking uh, regards to if we recover the library from the data folder, do the PDFs come as well? Um, yes, they do, which is the beauty of doing that because the PDF as well as the reference information is stored there. So you should be able to um, recreate that with the attached PDFs. Um, another question. 
Do many of your PhD students use the import folders function to set up groups that mirror their folder structure? Um, no. When you say, sorry, this is um, from Imogen. Um, when you say their folder structure, do you mean like in like File Explorer or on Windows or something like that? Yes, okay. Use the file folders. I've never seen that. No, actually, not not that I've not that it's been mentioned to me. And Scott, my colleague who's sitting with me, says no, he hasn't come across that either. So is it just an option there? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. But no, no. Um yeah, I've just got somebody else. Sorry, Imogen, if that's not clear. No, we haven't. Um, I didn't realise that was an option. Um, if, um, but uh, I've had someone ask, it's just, okay, thank you. Um, I thought there was just one level of folder that was available. Do you mean um, the person asking that around creating groups was just one folder level? because you can create group sets. Is that something where you can, uh, all right. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, the, sorry, there's just a bit of a discussion going on there. Um, I've got another question here. Do you ever recommend show master and sub documents and what are the risks? No. Is that a word thing? Because I'm unfortunately, not... yeah, Marvin, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not familiar with that one, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with that one. So um, the only risks I could think of is if it's something to do with merging, um, they never recommend to merge separate, if they are sort of separate documents in any which way, I don't know. Maybe um, sometimes that can cause issues when they're formatted. So that's why we recommend turning them into unformatted citations. So I don't know whether if you do use that master sub document, so I don't recommend it, and I'm not used to it, unfortunately. Maybe that would be a risk, perhaps. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I wondered if it was something way to manage their large documents. Um, the only that's the only risk I could see if it's some way of sort of merging things together. Perhaps look at doing. Um, uh, the unformatted, but whether that's an easy thing to do around that, that might be something to explore if you like. No worries. Okay, is there any further questions out there or anything that I haven't answered to anyone? Or if there's anything else I can, we can clarify for you? Um, if there's nothing else, um, I'll just give it a couple of minutes, but if there's um, nothing else, Okay. Well, I'd just like to say from Scott, Kay and myself, thank you very much for coming along today. Please, if there's anything else that occurs to you later on, please do get in contact with me um, uh, or us and we're very happy to um, further talk about either the teaching side or the EndNote side of things and um, good luck with it. Uh, EndNote is a great one to teach and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for viewing.